try and keep this uh, on time. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, uh, DOE ARC seminar series. Um, let's see, our speaker today is uh, Dave Kleider from John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, David is the lead of Team Team. He's one of the lead, three leads of the ARC projects. So he's going to talk about noise in quantum systems impact and mitigation strategies. Uh, a little bit be as a background of Dave. He is a um, principal professional staff at John Hopkins. And um, he got his PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Rochester in 2008. And uh, shortly after that, he joined uh, the staff at uh, JHU. So I'm going to give the floor over to David and to talk about the, the cool research that his team is doing. Thank you, Bert. Can you see this? Yes. All right, hopefully full screen is there and working. Yes, it's per working perfectly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, first, I want to, of course, acknowledge our funding agencies that make all of this possible. Uh, what you'll see today was funded through, I'm sure, uh, some of the work by LPS, uh, DOE, team, team, again, as Bert mentioned, and uh, our new research office. And of course, um, I am a, a manager at APL, and then I lead projects. So of course, none of this work is, is often done by me, but I have to acknowledge the team there. In particular, the results that you're going to see today on the theory side, uh, much of the, the, the many of the brains behind it were, were led by Kevin Schultz, especially the second half of this talk. You're going to see work on uh, what we call this model based uh, noise, uh, uh, model based method for noise characterization and mitigation. Uh, and then on the experimental side, that work was led by Tim Sweeney, and much of the, the actual experiments were done by Mr. Murphy. So, so I thank all of them. Uh, but, but all in all, uh, this was a, very much a team effort. And some of the results you'll see today even were, were done by some students here, uh, even high school students that did a lot of our programming and writing on the experience and the simulations. And Raj and Greg did a great job leading uh, many of these students. So David, you do go in and out a little bit on your sound, just so you know. Okay, thank you. I will try and get a little closer to my, my computer. Okay, so I want to talk this whole talk today is about noise. And why do I care about noise? Well, obviously for NIST machines, it's a, it's a big deal, but it's also a big deal for, for future fault tolerant machines. Uh, in particular, we know that the type of noise that's on your system can have a large impact on uh, the performance of quantum error correction. And so some results, I'm just gonna quickly skim through here, but uh, we've known about this for some time, even from, from work by Prestel in the early 2000s, um, even earlier than that, right? Talked about how we know how noise correlations can impact scalable quantum computing. Uh, this really nice work work here that I'm highlighting from Iron Poulin showed that for you know a given fidelity, which is often our metric of choice for how good our current modern day you know, quantum computers are, uh, you, you pick a fidelity that's this x-axis of your physical gates. You can get many orders of magnitude spread in the output logical fidelity. This is at the lot for the logical error rates, many orders of magnitude spread depending on the type of noise. We saw similar results in this paper from a few years ago, or just different error models. These are distributions of output logical error rates, just shown a little bit differently than what, what they showed over here. You can get very, very drastic changes, exact same gate fidelity, just different noise models, very uh, drastically different looking distributions. And a lot of this was, um, some of this was seeded by this work by, by uh, uh, Sanders, Long and Sanders, where they showed that, you know, hey, a given gate fidelity that I have showed here on the x-axis can lead to very drastically different error rates. And what I mean by this is like the poly error rates that one would put into a simulation, say, on the quantum error correction code. And again, you could get, you have, say, a 99.9% .9 fidelity that could still mean you know, that's upper bounded by, say, 10% error rate, which would be well above threshold. And so understanding the kind of noise you have in your system is pretty critical to understanding uh, the performance of fault tolerant machines. And of course, this is this is even maybe more true in the NIST era where we are now, where we're trying to squeeze out all the performance we can out of current systems. Uh, it's very important to, to understand and mitigate the types of noise that we have. And 
So this is work by our colleague on, on PMP by Fred Chong's group, where they showed just um, with, with knowledge of you know, the underlying hardware, this is on the IBM, uh, on the IBM machines, if you can compile algorithms just to avoid the noisy parts of your machine, you can have drastically greater success rates. And so if we're showing here, it's uh, different types of optimizers over the these gray bars or the standard biscuit implementation that they can get drastically improved success rates. Um, you know, another way to improve your success rate, it, and what I mean by success rate here is the ability to estimate some parameters through this technique called zero noise extrapolation. Where you basically take your circuit and you and you stretch it in time. And so that adds more noise. And from there, you can start connecting data points with different amounts of noise and you can extrapolate down to the zero noise limit. And I'll talk a little bit about this later in the talk about where sometimes, it's, again, the types of noise on your system might limit the ability of us to do extrapolations like this. So what type of noise do we have on actual hardware? Of course, it's sort of the standard noise. Maybe we all think about depolarizing noise, independent IID noise that the folks that do quantum error correction love to think about. But in reality, we have very, um, in some sense, complicated noise in our system. In particular, I want to highlight two, two things that we know exist, and that's spatial correlations. This is a sort of a cross coupling between qubit to qubit. Uh, so this is a, a really nice example of a characterization technique out of Steve Flamia's group where they looked at the IBM system and they just compared qubit to qubit coupling. And they and just you know highlighting here, you know, qubit 13 uh, to qubit one, they, these are these two qubits here. They're of course you know connected next to each other. They have a very, uh, the, the size of these squares here sort of determine the amount of coupling that they were able to observe. And so, uh, you know, it may be not surprising that, that, that qubits like this, uh, you know, 12 and two are connected to each other in good crosstalk, but maybe more surprising is that things that aren't even really locally, coup uh, locally coupled uh, still have a surprising amount of crosstalk. And so uh, spatial correlations are of course something we're gonna have to look into both in the NIST era and beyond. And then of course, time correlations also exist. And so what I'm showing over here is work done. Um, uh, this is here by Daniel and Ladar's group where they looked at various um, quantum control sequences. And I think the big takeaway I just want to make from these two plots here is to say that if there were no time correlations, you would expect smooth exponential decay. These x-axis here is time and the y-axis is fidelity. And so with you know, Markovian totally un uncorrelated evolution, you would just expect, ex expect exponential decay. And what you see, of course, here in many cases is not. That's a strong indicator that there is time uh, correlation across uh, on these qubits that they were looking at. All right, now what I want to do is switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, the impact. This is some recent work that, that's on the archive and has just been accepted on how really crucial it is to understand the type of noise that you have in your system. And I'll give you an example here of a way to really fundamentally break quantum error correction in a way that you might not expect. So, so just as a quick review, the surface code is one of the leading contenders for fault tolerant quantum computation. I think this the audience here probably is, is familiar with this. Uh, you often see it put in, laid out in something like this, where the, the X and Z checks are colored, um, where, the, where the data qubits are, are, are one to nine, the ancilla qubits here, this is the 13 qubit version variant of this. Uh, and then the X and Z checks are just these, these colored regions with the circuits uh, drawn below that perform these check operations. Uh, why is it good? Well, it has a relatively high threshold of, of about 1% error per gate. Of course, everything's nearest neighbor coupled, which is quite nice uh, for, for implementation. And at, at the logical level, we can implement logic gates uh, just again through all nearest neighbor interactions through that circuit. So what I want to show you is an example that for this small distance three code here, we know that a distance three code can, can correct uh, a wave one error. I will show you that that's not exactly true in all cases. And why is that? Well, I'm going, what I'm showing right here, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll describe the simulation in a minute, but I'm going to add noise to just a single qubit in the simulation. And I, and I picked the middle one here, but it, it's actually completely arbitrary where I do it. Uh, I'm going to apply a small Y rotation. Why, why? Well, it gives me both X and Z errors. Again, that's, it's not really that, uh, it doesn't matter. I could do just X or Z as well. Uh, and the results would basically be the same. I'm going to draw a random angle at the start of my simulation. And then after every application of a gate that hits that qubit, I will apply noise to that qubit. This is a 
fairly standard error model that we use in, in simulating quantum error correcting codes. Again, with a caveat, I'm only doing it to a single qubit. The second piece is again that I just draw this angle once at the start and then keep it fixed through the lifetime of, of uh, each single Monte Carlo trial. The second Monte Carlo trial, I'll draw a new angle and then keep it fixed again through. And so, so what does this mean, right? If, if this is qubit four, then if I look at circuits where I apply errors again, it's every time after that gate happens. So this is the, 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 the stabilizer circuit for zero, one, three, four, these four qubits here. This is the, the circuit that does that. And so after the C naught gate between zero and four, I will apply an error. And then this is this check circuit down here. And so I have a C naught from, from the ancilla to qubit four that's going up in this direction. And after I do it, I will apply this error operation. When I do this, I get a, a curve that looks like this, where I'm plotting the physical infidelity on the x-axis and the logical infidelity on the y-axis. And what, I'm, what these dash bars are is where the, the logical fidelity is directly proportional to the physical fidelity. And this bottom dashed line is where the logical fidelity is proportional to the physical fidelity squared. This is what we would expect this bottom line for a distance three code. It should suppress your noise by a factor, by a squared factor. And we are not getting suppression here. So I will, I will leave this as a mystery as to why this is happening. Uh, and I'm gonna drop in a little bit into just discussions of noise in general and, and then clear this up uh, by the end. So first we need to talk about cor uh, noise correlations. And so I talked a little bit about spatial and temporal correlations, but in the context of a circuit, what they look like and within the context of error correction can be seen from these simple little uh, check operators for, for say the bit flip code. Uh, and so if, for example, you had a spatial correlation that caused two errors within a bit flip code, right? Then that the syndrome that one would get would be the one zero syndrome that is consistent with an error on the first qubit, right? And so you would incorrectly diagnose this error. This is a weight two error. Uh, you would incorrectly diagnose it and you would cause a logical fault. This is well known, There's no mystery here. The same is true for temporal correlation, right? If I have an error that occurs here in my circuit, and then again, later in time within the same circuit, this will cancel out this error here, right? The poly this, this poly X operator will transfer through the C naught and cause a, a flip here to the syndrome, but then this subsequent uh, poly X will cancel this one. And so this will get diagnosed as an error up on this uh, top qubit here, again, causing a, a fault down the road. Um, so these are both incorrectly diagnosed errors. And so now my question to you is what kind of Hamiltonians and or system bath interactions give rise to such correlations? Um, now, the results that follow are going to be analytical analysis, and I'm going to focus on spatial correlations. The reason for that is I'm going to look at a, a specific model of quantum error correction called the code capacity error model. And that's basically where I, I just stick noise at the beginning of my error correction circuit, and then there's no noise through the rest. This is not a fault tolerant analysis. This is just, again, it's called the code capacity model. Um, but in the context of fault tolerance, in some sense, temporal correlations are equivalent. What I mean by that is that everything I derive here will also apply to temporal correlations that span across decoding boundaries. Uh, and you'll see a little bit about that later. But for now, what you'll see is analytical analysis just for uh, spatial correlations. And so let me talk a little bit about you know, the types of noise uh, that one would get and how they might lead to these types of errors on a system that we know cause problems for quantum error correction. So first, let's think about a Hamiltonian that looks like this, where I have uh, an X rotation on qubit two, nothing on qubit three, and an X rotation on qubit three, nothing on qubit two. All right, so this might, this might arise, this is independent, right? Uh, rotations on qubits two and three, there's no coupling, this is completely independent. Um, if, I, if I calculate the unitary operator that arises from this Hamiltonian, this is fairly trivial, right? What I get, is, is I, get, I get something that looks like this, where I have a cosine term um, with uh, a, a squared factor with identity on qubits two and three. I get a, a term here that's proportional to sine and cosine, where I get a, a, an X on qubit two and an X on qubit three. And then with probability sine squared, I will get 
this X2, X3. This is this two error that causes problems. And so the key point here, this theta here is just proportional to this eta in Hamiltonian times the time, right? So the key point here is that no errors occur with probability, say, order one. One error occurs, this is it's, if the angle is small, if theta is small, which we assume noise is typically weak. Uh, that one error occurs with probability theta and two errors occur here with probability theta squared. So this is good, right, for quantum error correction. This says that this type of noise, even though it's correlated, right, the angle on both two qubits are the same, this type of noise should not be problematic for quantum error correction, even though in some sense it's correlated. Again, this might come from, for example, like a common mode external field where you're trying to hit, say, a, a, an ion with your laser, and maybe it some leaks out to the other laser causing it a rotation that's unintended over there that's correlated. Now, a more troubling error to quantum error correction is that, say, like some two qubit interaction error here, where the Hamiltonian has actually has a weight two generator, where we have an XX interaction between the qubits. And why is that? Well, if you just look at the unitary for this, right, it's the cosine theta uh, times identity on both, right, that's no errors. And then with probability uh, theta here versus theta squared previously, we get two errors, right? So previously, the probability of a weight two error was is theta squared. Now my probability of a weight two error is order theta, right? And this, this is problematic uh, for quantum error correction. And so you, you, try and, uh, you try and reduce this as much as possible. And just to summarize here, right? These are the two types of models that I've described here, right? One is this sort of independent no correlated noise across two qubits where they cause independent rotations. And this other is this, uh, this interaction term this one is not problematic, easily handled by traditional error correction. This one is problematic because it basically places weight to errors on equal footing as single qubit errors. Now, everything I have presented so far is completely accepted status in the QEC community. There's a ton of details to be filled in, but there's really nothing new here. I should say one of the things I, I've, I've omitted in this sort of really toy example analysis is that the noise strength uh, is generally treated as a stochastic random variable. And that is that eta parameter in the Hamiltonian that I talked about. We usually say we draw from some normal, normal distribution with zero mean and some variance sigma. So now I'm going to build a model uh, that I'm going to talk about here, where I'm going to place, now within a quantum error correcting code, I'm going to place noise, again, in this code capacity model where I place all the noise at the beginning of the circuit. Uh, I'm going to place this is sort of the generalization of that two qubit version that I just had with here. I'm going to place the same exact rotation across all qubits in my, in my code. It's just x1, x2, x3, up to however many qubits. So say for the, the, nine, the nine qubit um, surface code that I mentioned before, this would just be x1 to x9. And then analytically, I can actually calculate the probability of a logical failure as a function of the variance of this random distribution. So for a distance three code, what this looks like, the probability of a physical error under this model, just say for a single qubit, essentially goes as sigma squared, okay? Whereas the probability for a logical failure goes as sigma to the fourth. And what I'm plotting here is uncorrelated and correlated. And what that means is in the uncorrelated case, I take this eta, this random variable to be independent and identically distributed across each qubit. So there'll be like an eta i term. Each one will be independent. The correlated case is this case that I describe right here in this equation, which is that it's the exact same rotation. It's still, it's still random, but it's the same. And what you see is that in both the correlated and uncorrelated cases, the, the, the logical error rate is suppressed relative to the physical error rate you know, by, a, by a squared factor. The prefactor is a little bit different though, with the correlated case being slightly higher. Turns out this was actually studied many, many, many years ago, this noise model. Uh, and what they found is that in this, in this case where you have exact correlation across all qubits is that you, you don't have a threshold that you get pseudo thresholds uh, because this prefactor keeps sort of building as, as the size of the code. So this isn't a complete killer to quantum error correction, but, it, but it, 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 it's slightly problematic. But that's not what I showed before. What I showed before was this case where he, where a single qubit error was causing even this exponent to be the same as the physical error rate. And so what's going on there? Well, what I haven't talked about, what I just showed you there was for Gaussian. 
But what if the noise is not Gaussian? And what our, what our results showed and what I showed in that very first plot was that non-Gaussian and heavy tailed noise can cause single qubit error generators to create multi-qubit correlated errors which then ultimately reduces the distance of the code, which of course is very harmful. And basically what I mean by that is I talked about these two different noise models, right? One, where you have this independent errors across each qubit, possibly with a correlated angle. And then I talked about these weight two error generators with this angle. But I said, you know, in the one case, the probability of a weight two error was eta squared. In the case here, it was eta. What I'm saying is, is that once you have heavy failed noise, it turns out that these two are equivalent and they throw weight two errors at the same rate for certain, for certain types of, of, uh, of distribution. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the analysis we've done here. But let me, just, let me just describe this. So for Gaussian noise, which is, from, which is the results that I showed before, you have that the physical error rate, like this is exactly what I had before, goes to sigma squared. Whereas the logical error rate for the uncorrelated and correlated cases goes sigma to the fourth, again, with the distance prefactor. For, for a Cauchy distribution, which is a very well known uh, heavy tail distribution, where now my tails, instead of falling off exponentially, they fall off polynomially, what you see is that the physical error rate goes as sigma, which is the width of the distribution here. The logical error rate when this angle is correlated, meaning when it's the same across all qubits, is also sigma. Even though it's a weight one generator, it will still cause uh, the logical error rate to scale as the physical error rate. If this angle is uncorrelated, meaning it's different IID across the different qubits in the code, you will get suppression of the logical error rate. So it will go as a squared factor. And so I just want to highlight here that the main takeaway, right, is that we want, this is for a distance three code, we want the logical error rate to be a, a, a squared factor proportional to the physical error rate. And what we're getting in the case of correlated heavy tailed noise is that it is in fact not, even though the, the generators look like this, where there's weight one error generators. So, uh, don't read too much into this table. I'm going to highlight the pieces I want you to pick out from this. But there's a distribution called the student's T distribution that looks a lot like the Cauchy distribution I just before, showed before you. And so we analyzed this distribution. And the reason this is nice is that there's a parameter nu up here. If we, if we look at that nu equal to 1, 1 plus 1 over 2, that thing drops out. And this becomes the Cauchy distribution that I just showed you. In the limit that nu goes to infinity, you get a Gaussian distribution. Turns out it's a little bit easier to do a few of odd values of nu because this, then this uh, whole uh, exponent up here is an integer. And so we, that's what we, we plot in this table. We're just taking integer values of this exponent, which basically serve to tighten the tails of the distribution, right? And so as you, as you continue to increase this nu, you get closer and closer to the Gaussian. So what do I want you to take away from this? Let me show you. Uh, what, what this plot. So on, on each of these rows is for a different value of this tail index. So with nu equals one, that's sort of the widest tails. So that's this Cauchy distribution. And what you get, and so this is all analytic results that we calculated exactly, sort of what we've done, the low, um, the low error rate scaling, um, the sub so-called sub-threshold scaling uh, of this code. And what you see is that in the case where you have uncorrelated noise for a distance three qubit, um, you get the, the if, if the noise is uncorrelated, in all cases, you get suppression of the physical error rate. So the physical error rate scales as sigma, the width of this distribution. The logical error rate for uncorrelated noise scales exactly as you'd expect for distance three, it goes as sigma squared, for distance five, sigma cubed, so on and so forth, right? This is just D minus one over two scaling, exactly as you'd expect. And so I put those in green saying, this is working as we expect uh, of an error correcting code. The correlated case, however, always sigma. There's absolutely no suppression in this case where we have Cauchy noise. So now this goes full circle back to that analysis that I showed you on that first slide uh, with, with, with one slight distinction, right? On that very first slide that I showed you, I took Cauchy noise and applied it to a single qubit. 
but I had time correlations. I applied the exact same angle every time step that happened. And so what that, and so I, and so I mentioned that, right? That, that the code capacity model where I had spatial correlations is equivalent to these temporal correlations uh, over sort of decoding boundaries. And so, um, and so that's what happened there. I can apply a, a single error generator on a single qubit, but because it's Cauchy noise and it's time correlated, uh, this analysis is showing us that you'll get no suppression. And that's exactly what we saw with that numeric simulation. And then I'll just, I'll plop through a couple more of these, right? Uh, as you tighten the tails of these distribution, what you see is that this sort of bad behavior gets pushed further up to higher distance codes. So for new equal to seven, what you see is that at distance three and distance five, you get full suppression of the, of the physical error rates. You get different prefactors, but you get the, the, the scaling, the sub-threshold scaling that you would expect, sigma to the four, sigma to the six, and so on. Here are the, the physical error rate, the sigma squared. Uh, but once you get to distance seven, it starts to break down. And ultimately above that, you get no further suppression. So going to larger codes does not help you uh, with this type of noise. And then finally, say this is distance nine, uh, similar behavior, it just gets pushed out further. You need, uh, once up at distance nine, you stop getting suppression uh, and, it, and it gets pushed further out. Um, so so that, that was all just analytical models for this code capacity error model. Um, I, we have done uh, simulations of time correlated noise across, and basically here what we do again, similar to what I showed you before, where I drew just a single angle and applied that same angle in time. Um, here I'm now applying uh, arbitrary time correlated noise, and then the second half of the talk I'll try to tell you a little bit about how we do this. Um, but we, we we do it through exponential moving averages, and basically all these numerical results confirm the analytical theory. And I'll just highlight here. So this is a distance three surface code with Gaussian noise and uh, time correlations here going from white noise, which is no time correlations to DC where it's like completely correlated it's the same angle every time. And then all of these different EMAs just start adding in more and more time correlations sort of interpolating between the two cases. And what you see is that you get suppression exactly as you'd expect. You get the logical error rate goes as the physical error rate squared. So Gaussian noise, no problem whatsoever, even if there's correlations. You might again get a slightly different prefactor, which might adjust the threshold a little bit, but in terms of the th sub threshold scaling, uh, there's no issues. Um, students T, again, this is now for these different new parameters with different tail index, as long as you have no time correlation. So this is white noise, no time correlation. Again, your th sub threshold scaling is fine. The logical error rate scales as your physical error rate. It's when you add in time correlations, again, which is equivalent to the spatial correlations that I talked about in my analytic model, that you start seeing this problem. But what's neat here is that we can now interpolate between sort of the uncorrelated and the correlated cases. And so we, we pick the distribution in this plot. And again, many more details in the paper that I referenced in that archive paper, uh, a particular form of a distribution called a stable distribution that allows us to, to do time correlations in a nice manner. And so what we do is we interpolate between white noise, which basically has the logical error rate scaling as the physical error rate squared up to DC or fully time correlated noise. And then in between where we apply an exponential moving average it sort of interpolates between these two cases. And again, the stable distribution is an example of a heavy tail distribution, but like the students see, it lets us interpolate between Gaussian and heavy tails in a nice smooth manner. And so I picked some particular uh, form parameter value that gives us a heavy tail distribution. And what you're seeing is that the, that the ability of the error correcting code to suppress physical noise is dependent here upon the, the amount of time correlation within the system. Similarly here, this is full time correlation. I'm not actually able on this, in this particular type of noise to do time correlated noise through, through technical difficulty just because of the type of noise that it is. But again, this is a numerical simulation now varying the tail index that confirms the analytic results that we had before. But basically for a distance three code, for new equal one, which is the Cauchy noise, we get no suppression. And then as we start tightening the index, tightening the tails of this distribution, we start dropping down this logical error rate until at new equal to four and five, we get the sub-threshold scaling that's proportional to the physical error rate squared that we would expect from a distance three code. So again, the sort of high level takeaway from this is sync weight one error generators, while you know, assumed to be fine, and that's what we can correct, if the noise 
is drawn from heavy tail distributions and it's some sort of space or time correlations. Uh, it is clearly not good for quantum error correction. Now, the immediate question might be, well, no one's ever really thought of this is, is, is heavy tailed noise present? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think if one were to go look for this, I would look at one over F noise. We know that one over F noise exists in many types of solid states, well, in, in nearly all solid state systems and superconducting qubits and the quantum dot systems are, are examples of, of that. Um, this is not my idea. When I started looking into this, uh, Mandelbrot wrote a lot about this. He was so puzzled that he actually wrote a, a whole entire book about this. Uh, his motivation was to, he wanted to unify the long tails in time with long tails in space. And what I mean by this is sort of the so-called Millet and Joseph's effect as he, as he called it in this, in this paper here from, from the 60s, where right, the, the Noah effect is this so-called this very rare event, right? This, this, this flood that happens that you know, has this drastic impact, uh, but happens extraordinarily rarely and sort of out of the blue. Uh, and this is, this is this so-called, this is the type of noise sort of that I, that I analyzed that, for, for the error correction code. But then you have this, this other sort of time correlated noise where this Joseph's effect where you, you know, this, this is the, the, you know, the seven, seven years of, of, of plenty followed by seven years of famine where you have sort of very predictable events that go from good to bad, but they're predictable and they sort of come in at the well-defined time. And these are these time correlations that come in. And so he was looking to unify these two effects uh, in, this, in, in these papers. And so, so the reason this the reason this is important for one over f noise is that one over f is an example where you can take sort of Gaussian noise and create one over f noise um, in, in time, but that doesn't necessarily cause heavy tail distributions in space. Um, but through a lot of these papers um, that attempt to unify these things, basically what pops out is that there are, there there are physical models that lead to one over F noise, we put that come from these levy laws, which are, which are heavy tail distributions. Um, and just, you know, sort of this quote, quote here of how you get one over F noise, you know, sort of the standard model that we have in, you know, in things that we think about is they come from two level fluctuators, which is the sum of Lorentzian thing. Uh, and, and they quote here, you know, our model here yields a one over F spectra and a wide range of frequencies. And so in contrast to the Gaussian distribution of signal intensity, the sum of uncorrelated components, the point process exhibits asymptotically a power law distribution with signal intensity. A power law distribution is a heavy tail. So my only point to bringing this up is I don't know if this is the if this is what causes one of the noise in the systems. I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert on this, but again, given how how much we know now that this could cause problems, I think it's a place to look. Uh, I wanted to also highlight, you know, the role here for QCBV. Uh, you know, that's quantum characterization, verification, and validation. And that is simply let's develop techniques to go look, find out if this type of noise exists in systems. And um, this does require a rethinking of, of current noise characterization tools. You know, this has been thought about. Uh, our colleague on, on our, our, our uh, team project, uh, Lorenzo Viola from Dartmouth, has thought about this uh, and looked, done, developed Hewitt noise spectroscopy techniques for around Gaussian debasing environments. And, and uh, this really nice paper by, by Lee, who, who's also on our project with us and Lorenza, showing how to, how to extend uh, Hewitt noise spectroscopy to the non-Gaussian case. The difference there was that those all looked at uh, distributions tighter than the Gaussian, not heavy tail. And, and, the, and the, the reason that it's problematic is that most of these techniques rely on accumulant expansion. We sort of have the bath operators and the qubit bath operators that then lead to expansions in where you, where you compute expectation values of these, of these two time correlation functions. In the Gaussian case, you only have to worry about the, uh, this first uh, cumulant here and all the sort of higher order cumulants can just be written in terms of the, of the second moment. Um, Non-Gaussian noise requires you to keep these, these four cumulants or greater, but, but uh, as long as the distributions are well-defined, this is all fine and that's what we showed here. The problem with heavy tailed noise is that these um, you know, the variance is often not defined. And so the, these types of human expansions will not work. So it would require a rethinking. Um, yes, and that's, that's sort of what I say here. So there is, there is sort of new techniques needed to determine if such noise exists. Uh, and, and if so, at what level right, to determine whether or not it would be a problem. Okay, so the sort of conclusions from the first uh, portion of this talk is that uh, I've shown you that semi-classical space or time correlated noise is problematic for quantum error correction. 
Uh, even noise on a single qubit, that, that first plot I showed you is not protected uh, if it has certain type of distribution and a certain type of time correlation. And so the sort of open questions that I've left you with, all right, does it exist? I don't know. I suggest looking at one of rough noise or right? Joseph's effect, as I mentioned. We do know we don't have any techniques to characterize this thing. And then the last thing, the sort of more positive spin to this is that um, I would guess that there are physical layer noise mitigation methods that we can do to minimize this, right? If you have perfectly uh, space correlated noise, uh, we know we can encode them, say, in, in decoherence free subspaces to mitigate that noise. And so if you have perfectly time correlated noise, we know that there are um, you know, quantum control sequences that you can apply. And so I think that there are ways to mitigate this as well. And I, uh, those are open questions that we're looking to, to study. All right, in, in the second portion of this talk, I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, briefly about this model that enabled us to do these time correlated simulations that I showed you in the last plot. Um, and basically, right, we know in quantum systems that um, what, what we desire, right, are really well-behaved circuits, right, where this might be a circuit, a couple of Hadamard gates, a CNI, you know, poly X, whatever, Y over two rotation. This is what we desire. We're going to enact that through some, you know, Hamiltonian and Schrodinger's equation, and our Hamiltonian say it's perfect, and we can exact enact these perfect gates. Real life is not so nice. Right, we have some general open quantum system, maybe described by a master equation, maybe described by a very general open system. We have noise in the Hamiltonian, and in addition to the control, but we also have coupling that. And so, really, instead of this nice, like, well-defined discrete circuit, we have just some big quantum process that happens across our system. The question is, can I sort of retain this simple description in terms of gates and noise, but while have keeping access to these space and time correlations that I just showed you are so problematic. And so we have this model now, the shawarma model, this model-based approach that lets us do this. Basically lets us drop in errors into a circuit, but that will retain these space and time correlations through a circuit level noise model. And again, that's what I used in the previous slides to do those temporarily correlated simulations. I should say, stop me at any time if you have any questions. I am trying to go quickly because I have a lot of material here. Uh, but it, it may be fast enough that I'm losing people. So another way to say this is I want an efficient method to simulate a wide range of correlated errors in a quantum circuit. In other words, I want to take you know this, this simple circuit description, and I just want to drop in noise into my circuit such that I can retain correlations in time and correlations in space such that it preserves all the physics of the underlying system, but that is abstracted away into this model uh, that, can I, that I can use in circuit simulations. And that's exactly what this uh, shawarma model does. We, we, we backronymed it into Schrodinger wave ARMA or shawarma, which is this, it, it really is adopted from this time series, this classical time series model, of what are known as autoregressive moving average or ARMA models do this. And this is, uh, you know, I pointed out earlier, a lot of this work was spearheaded by my colleague, Kevin Schultz. And this is a lot of this is, is the brainchild. I want to give him credit for, for many of these ideas. And so, what is, what is briefly a, a normal model? Well, this is, this is the general description. If you can look it up on Wikipedia, you'll get where you have a, a time series indexed by this, this time index here, y sub, y sub k. And so your, your output noise uh, is equal to this sum over x. So x is a random variable, generally chosen to be, to be Gaussian random variables. But where you'll sum over multiple random variables and you'll have some lag. Right, where you'll, where you'll have this time index here and you'll start going back in time, right? And so you can immediately see how this builds in time correlations into this output, right? Because the noise at time step K will be built up of noise from previous time steps, right? And so this, this is often, you know, a moving average model would be constructed out of just this portion here. But you can also feed the last time step of the output into the into the current into the current system, and that's and that's this part here. And this is the so-called AR part, and this is the MA part. So this is the autoregressive moving average part. And the output then is a correlated stream, a temporally correlated stream of errors. So what the what the shawarma process does is it takes this classical model that that's been around forever. And it maps it to the space of CPTP maps, which is the, the space of error operation, quantum operations that describe noise in a quantum system. And so we can do this for both sort of unitary errors, which is what I did in the previous analysis for quantum error correcting codes, 
uh, where it's actually relatively simple. It's just the matrix exponential of the Hamiltonian with this, with this uh, error operation at time t. We can also do it for general CPT maps. And I'll leave all the gory mathematical details to this, this paper here uh, that, that's currently in the review, but it's available on the archive. But again, what it does enable us to do is a very formal method to, to allow us to just drop in errors within a circuit, but that retains all the physics uh, of the underlying uh, correlated noise model up to, up to some, uh, some assumptions about the noise. And so what this enables us to do is it's really a research driver for us. And it's a backbone of many of our theoretical and experimental efforts at APL, both on modeling, the injection, the characterization, and the control side. And so the really, um, you know, on the modeling side, it lets us, on our noise injection experiments, it lets us define sort of the, the, the power spectra that we use for our noise injection experiments. Uh, on our characterization experiments, it lets us parameterize the noise that we are characterizing. And it really then motivates our, our, our control experiments. So when we're devising control protocols to mitigate the effects of noise, we often use this, this as a model to derive, and you'll see, you'll see some of this at the end of this, uh, some really nice work where we're able to derive optimal control pulses through this model-based approach. And then why do we do you know, noise injection, noise characterization and control or on the injection side, right? Noise injection really lets us validate our models, right? We can plug noise into our experimental systems and we can make sure that our models Right, are, are actually you know, describing what we're seeing in our physical system. It also lets us validate our characterization protocols, right? When we run them in a real life system, if we inject more noise, it lets us make sure that, that our characterization is able to pick that up. And of course, it lets us validate our control protocols. If we inject noise, we apply a control, uh, we can see that we're actually mitigating that noise before we go to the sort of native experiments. And then finally, on the characterization side, right, if we describe the noise processes, on our system in terms of these models, we can then use control, we can inform our control to derive optimal uh, control. And then ultimately, why do we do control, right? That's better system performance. That's noise mitigation we're all after, both to mitigate the types of noise that I described earlier for fault tolerant systems, but also of course at NIST, uh, NIST machines. Uh, all of this software, all of this, the shawarma that is done is, is available on this GitHub repo. Uh, I'll just leave this up here and it's available on our website as well. Uh, that you can, that you can uh, download this. And, and all of the figures from the paper that I described um, are, are available there as well. Okay, so just a, a, a few brief comments of each of these and then I'll close out. So on the, on the noise modeling side, uh, this, is, this is the paper that we referenced that, that has the shawarma, the shawarma work. It's on the archive here, all the gory mathematical details that are in there, including all the error analysis and so on. But this is really the, the model-based approach how you simulate time correlated noise in, in quantum circuits. And we're really trying to exploit the generality of ARMA, the classical model to simulate arbitrary noise spectrum. And so what do I mean by that is there's a very well-defined relationship sort of in the classical world where I take this ARMA model and this can approximate to arbitrary accuracy any, any, uh, any power spectrum any, or any spectral density. And uh, so any noise spectra can be defined in terms of this, in terms of this ARMA model. And so what this lets us do is that we can simulate, uh, say, for example, um, noise, arbitrary noise with arbitrary power spectra uh, in a quantum system. And what we've done here on these plots is that we've actually simulated doing quantum noise spectroscopy with some, all sorts of different types of noise. And this is band limited noise where we, where we put in noise with certain bands, right? This is a band pass noise where I have uh, just this pass here or low pass noise just below a certain cutoff. And, and all these are just numerical experiments confirming that hey, you know, I, can, I can sort of numerically inject this noise into my model. Uh, I can uh, uh, put arbitrary power spectra and I can reconstruct it using my, um, uh, my noise spectroscopy protocols. We can do multipole noise. We can do this you know, one over F noise that I talked about earlier. So any type of noise you can think of uh, can be modeled using this method, uh, which makes it quite universal and quite nice. Um, and again, that's what I used in those, in those experiments on of error correction. So what does this enable us to do? Well, more practically, it lets us do noise injection experiments very, very simply. So again, uh, I'll point you to this paper. This was, a, was an experimental paper led by uh, my colleague, Tim Sweeney. Um, so again, all the gory experimental details on this, on this archive paper here, but where we use this Schwarma model in an experiment to inject uh, arbitrary time correlated noise. Now, what this paper actually did was it, was it we wanted to experimentally show that this could 
this sort of very simple circuit level approach could mimic the types of noise injection that were done uh, through much more complicated experiments. For example, by you know, Mike Beardchick and Will Oliver, they did some really, really nice experiments early on where they injected noise. And so we, we, we reproduced some of those experiments, but then showed that the Schwama method was equivalent. And so, so the way, or then maybe I'll say the, the old ways that you might inject noise is that right, noise on a qubit, say dephasing noise, causes your, your, to get a little bit of uncertainty in where your, your block vectors, right? If you have noise along Z, it'll cause a, a rotation about that axis that'll make uh, it a little bit uncertain as to where you are here. So an equivalent way to, to make this noise, a completely equivalent thing that you can do in the lab is that you can inject noise along the master clock. And that sort of, while your, your qubit might be steady when you're injecting noise, what it does is it kind of shifts around the, 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 uh, the, uh, the coordinate system. But, but the two are just completely equivalent, right? Shifting of the coordinate system is exactly the same as like, shifting of the qubit. And so these are completely identical. Now, we implemented uh, our noise injection protocol by injecting noise directly onto the master clock of our system. In addition, we also applied noise using the Schwarma model, where we would apply a gate and apply a noise with some angle phi, and apply a gate and a noise with some angle phi. And so this is sort of this, the Schwarma method where just after sort of a quote unquote perfect gate, we apply noise. And we wanted to verify that all of these were equivalent. And so uh, this is this is plots of both the the gate based and, and SDR. I should say what SDR, the software defined radio. That was what was used to to create the, the noise that was then put on top of our master clock. And so so I can't actually remember which the solid lines are are let's just say the gate based and the and the dash lines are the SDR based. But these are the uh, these are we're doing you know C, fixed total time uh, basically CPNG style noise spectroscopy experiments to to um, detect. The noise. And so what this is saying is that we injected band pass noise into our systems in these two methods, both this, this gate base as well as this sort of standard you know, on the clock based SDR system. And we're showing very, very good experimental agreement between the two approaches. And this is saying that, again, the shawarma approach on an experimental system is, is completely equivalent. Um, why do we care? Well, this now lets any of you here do noise injection experiments. And so you can test all your noise mitigation protocols that you might want uh, on cloud-based platforms. And so we showed that in this paper. So in addition to our own experimental platform, we also then use the Schwarma technique. It's actually trivial to inject it onto the IBM Quant experience because if you just do the phasing noise, those are like free gates that you can apply in a system. And there's just now a prescription to inject arbitrary time correlated noise in the system. And again, what we're showing here is that we're injecting sort of uh, arbitrary power spectra into uh, the IBM system. And we're doing, doing CPMG style experiments to, to detect uh, the power spectra that we're, that, we're, that we're injecting into the system. And what you're seeing here are these plots are what we actually inject on these sort of dash lines and then the reconstruction of the solid line. So we're injecting some band limited noise and accurately reconstructing it at a high frequency. There's a little bit of mismatch that we're attributing to some native noise in the system that, that that is actually there, right, that we're picking up. So um, uh, these are just some details of the experiment that happened, but the, the point is, um, again, anybody now can go and do noise injection experiments uh, uh, on the IBM systems, which is very nice when you're trying to validate your characterization and your noise mitigation protocols and you're able to inject sort of no noise into the system. Um, on the characterization front, um, uh, th there's a lot of really nice work here that I don't have time to run into. Um, uh, again, my colleague Kevin can, can talk to that in much more detail, but I'll, but I'll say that we, one of the things that we have used this for is to study the impact of correlated errors on ZNE, on zero noise extrapolation, right? And so I talked earlier before about zero noise extrapolation as a way to uh, better estimate um, uh, parameters safe from variation of quantum algorithms where you have some noise in your system, you're trying to estimate some, uh, say, eigenvalue of some, of some Hamiltonian, say some variation of a quantum eigensolver. Uh, and so what you do is that you, you scale the noise and then you do an extrapolation down to the zero noise limit. And so what do you need? There's two main ingredients for this. You need a noise scaling method that's some means of increasing or scaling the noise. And then you need an inference method, right? That's some method to, to fit the data and extrapolate down to the zero noise limit. Ideally that fits what the actual uh, zero noise limit is. 
And so our colleagues at the Unitary Fund have come up with a scheme. So the original scheme re required very low level access to the devices. It required you to actually stretch the individual pulses, meaning I had to make the pulses take longer in time. Uh, it required a hands-on experimentalist. And again, our, our previous work that we just showed, it's very nice cloud-based processors give you sort of high level access, anybody access. And so the question is, can we come up with a the digital way of doing zero noise extrapolation that does not require this low level pulse axis. And so they showed two methods that we'll call, one we'll call local folding and the other global, where you stretch circuits to add noise, sort of in one of two ways. One, I can just take individual gates, they're unitary, so I can just apply, you know, the G dagger times G, that's the unitary, but it takes longer in time, right? And so this will sort of stretch the, 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 the gates out in time. In other ways, you can just take the circuit and apply the inverse circuit and then the forward circuit again. Again, these should all just be identity circuits, but with noise, they're not exactly, and so they amplify the noise. So they showed that this could work and allow, again, access uh, to ZNE to a much broader range of folks that don't have low level access. And so we went and looked at these methods and we looked at how one, what would happen to ZNE if you had time correlated noise. And in the interest of time, I won't go into a great deal of details here, except to say that we ran two qubit RV circuits. We know then that the survival probability in the zero noise limit should be one. And we looked at all sorts of different uh, noise scaling method, right? Uh, pulse, actual pulse stretching. This was sort of the original way that was done. Uh, that should be in, in theory, the most accurate. Uh, global folding, local folding, and then a couple of other methods that sort of stretching basically the pulses through, through a variety of uh, sort of digital approximate digital techniques that are trying to approximate uh, the direct noise scaling. And what you're seeing here is that, um, for, if I plot over here, the error of the, the ZNE approximation, like how good it gets to the true value, um, as, you, as you increase the noise, as you scale, it gets drastically, you get, you get a, a, a very high level uh, error for some of these um, uh, types, uh, types of methods. And in particular, then what we saw is that global folding this method where you flip the whole circuit and do it again, seemed to perform the best um, when, when uh, seemed to perform the best. Uh, and, and so the question was why? And it turns out if you look at the filter function of this circuit, this is for one qubit circuit, you can actually see why. This global unitary folding um, basically preserved the frequency content of the original circuit the best. And we know when we have time correlated noise that we're able to echo out and reduce the impact of noise. And so what was happening when we were doing say local unitary folding or some of these other methods that the, that the base sequence, this is the, the filter function of the base sequence is very different than the, than the filter functions of these sort of uh, stretched sequences. But in the global folding case, it sort of best approximated that base sequence. And that's why we saw in the presence of time correlated noise, why, the uh, global folding is the best. So the point is, is that when you do have unitary correlated noise, it is imperative to characterize it because even if you NIST style algorithms, it will affect your, um, your noise mitigation protocol. Finally, very quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about how we use the Schwarma technique to inform control design. And so um, the filter function formalism allows us, this is a technique that's well known. There's some references down here that you can look at, but basically, uh, it allows us to relate uh, spectral properties of the noise with filter functions that I was just talking about that, that describe the system control. And what we try and do is we try and minimize the overlap between our control response and our noise. And so that should give us the best possible gates. Now, so a shawarma model can de define the power spectral density of the noise. And so the idea is one, one thing that we can do is use filter shaping techniques this is well known in open quantum systems. We try and define the control such as say if all of our noise is at low frequency, we try and make the control only have um, uh, filter functions or you know have its filter function concentrate at the high frequencies, not low, or vice versa. Um, alternatively, in, in again going to this model, I want to do everything sort of at the circuit level because that's sort of the, the, the computer scientist level. Are there ways that I can combine these Schwarma models, which is circuit level model correlated noise, with these? On control sequences to define optimal control sequences. And that's sort of what we've done here in this, in this work, where we're going to sort of combine these ideas from dynamically corrected gates, these circuit level models, with this optimal control theoretic model where you actually take into account the power spectrum of the noise 
And we, we have a case where we can derive provably optimal control in the case of classical amplitude control noise. And kind of deep more detail, but just to say that this is an example for an ARMA parameterized model of, of, of temporally correlated noise on control lines, we can derive pulse sequences that are provably optimal. So this is an example, and I won't go into the details. Of this data, sorry, dog barking. Uh, theta describes the, the, the parameters of the noise, the noise correlation. This is a moving average model, model derived in our model. And it tells us exactly how the, the pulse amplitudes for a three pulse sequence here need to be related to the ARMA model coefficients. And these are some uh, analytic solutions to uh, for different time correlations. That this is a two pulse sequence that we can plot easily that show uh, optimally derived pulses, pulse sequences. Um, and, and the, the lines here are just numerical, or the, the dash plot, the, the crosses here are numerical solutions showing that our analytic solutions do in fact find these global optimal solutions. So again, uh, sorry, this is very quick that I'm rushing through this, but basically we have a technique now for amplitude noise. We have a convex optimization problem that allows us to solve for optimal pulse sequences using this ARMA model. And everything's just derived in terms of these ARMA models. And this is work that's, that's still in progress at the moment. Um, but but it's looking very promising as a, as a promising noise mitigation technique. So this is just now summarizing everything. Uh, the Schwarm model really lets us do many things, right? It, it can model noise. Uh, we have the basic theory, the heavy tail stuff that I presented earlier. We can do noise injection. There's some quantum sensing that we've done with this that I didn't talk about here. Um, it lets us characterize noise. So impact of time correlation and DNA. There's some parametric spectrum stuff that I haven't talked about. Uh, and then finally, it allows us to derive optimal control sequences, so model-based optimal control. Um, uh, and, and again, the software is available that does much of this. So with that, I am done just about on time, hopefully enough time for the question or two if there are any, but uh, sort of the first half of this talk, I demonstrated, right, the space and time correlated noise uh, can cause extreme harm to quantum error correction when this noise sticks its have heavy tails. And this is just even single qubit rotations. Um, so future work on this, right, is to figure out ways to both characterize and mitigate these types of noise. Uh, a lot of that will rely on this method that I talked about in the second half of this, which is the model-based approach, approach to understanding correlated noise in quantum systems, both model noise modeling, injection, characterization, and mitigation. Mm -hmm. So with that, thank you very much. I have, uh, I will take any questions that, that are still there. Thank you, Dave, for an excellent talk. Uh, are there any questions? I know we hit the hour, but uh, I think Dave is more than willing to uh, answer any questions you may have. Hello, may I ask a question, Dave? Eugene, yep. go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, you showed some. Uh, I, I, uh, my question is with regards to uh, actually characterizing in the real world. Um, the kind of statistical features that you talked about at the beginning um, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, with regards to correlated versus uncorrelated models in a general statistical sense. Uh, do, you, mm -hmm. um, um, do you have any uh, work there or is that somewhere that you're uh, going towards? Um, we, we've been um, having some, ah. some questions, I think that I have I, I, I have thought about it for like wow that we really should do that <laughs> I think that's the extent of the work that we've done so far. Okay. Um, so will, so so if you have thoughts on this, I, I would love to talk to you more yeah, about yeah. this because okay. uh, Let's follow up. time is time is a precious commodity. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's something that I'm very very interested in. But yeah, we haven't really spent a lot of time on it at the moment. Okay. Okay. I'll follow up. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? Hearing none, well then I'm going to close this seminar and uh, again by thanking Dave for an excellent talk. And uh, All right. Dave will announce the next speaker soon <laughs> in this seminar yes. series, which will be in, in June, right? Or are we skipping June? Yeah, first, first Wednesday of June, once I get okay. information. Cool. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you guys. <laughs>